Our first teller is Liz Manuel. She has been an active member of Storytellers of New Mexico since first moving to New Mexico over 20 years ago. Before turning over the reins to me this year, Liz led the production of our annual celebration since 2013. Her introduction to storytelling was hiding under the kitchen table, eavesdropping on the adult conversations and stories of the extended family members who showed up at her apartment, announced or unannounced. Liz says that not in her wildest imagination could she have imagined back then that these many years later, she would be Zooming from a home in New Mexico. Liz's storytelling has taken her across New Mexico and across the country to all the usual menus and to other perhaps more not quite so, from farm worker camps to juvenile prisons and projects with teen moms and United Nations ambassadors. Liz's charity tonight is World Central Kitchen. Tiffany will post the link in chat. We're delighted to have her here tonight. Please welcome Liz Manuel. I am so excited to be here today. And really, thank you, Cindy, for really picking this up from this year on. And um, it couldn't be in better hands. I really appreciate what you have done to get us here tonight. And, um, and speaking of the mythical, I am the one who will take you into that mythical realm tonight. And I'm gonna start with a story which is of the indigenous people of the island where I was born, of the Caribbean, especially of Santo Domingo, the island of Santo Domingo and the island of Puerto Rico. That's the island that I was born in. And it is a story of the Taino people. And it's interesting because we have a friend who used to live in Santa Fe. She is part Hopi and part Lakota. Every year on Thanksgiving Day, since she moved from Santa Fe, she calls us to wish us Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. And so the other day she called us ahead of time because she wanted to thank us for some recipes that we sent her over the mail. And I told her this story to kind of try it out on her. I've told it before, but I wanted to gift it to her. And she said, yes, she gave me her blessing to tell it tonight. So without further ado, this is the story. In the beginning, there were four mountains, Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, Iboriquen, Puerto Rico. And living in a small village by the edge of a green and lush rainforest lived a cacique a chief whose name was Yaya. Yaya lived with his wife Atabe and their only child, a young man whose name was Yayael. Yayael was widely loved by everyone in the village and widely respected for his skillful hunt hunting. Whenever he went hunting, he always brought back enough game to feed everyone in the entire village. Each day, Yayael would set out in the crack of dawn with his bow and arrow over his shoulders. The bow, his father, Yaya, carved for him from the wood of the Tabanuco tree. Now the Tabanuco tree was a tree that was widely highly revered for its magical and life-giving powers. And so he set out and one day, one day when Yayael was in the forest, one day when Yayael was in the forest, he noticed that the air became thick and the clouds darkened, the wind picked up and as the wind blew through the forest, the birds circled above, frantically flapping their wings, beating their wings. Yayael knew that Guabansek 
the goddess of hurricanes was near. And Yael ran. He ran for shelter, he ran for safety, but there was no escaping Guavansek. She was unstoppable. And the people out in the fields, they too knew the signs and they ran. They ran this way and that way looking for shelter. Many found shelter in a nearby by cave, but others could not escape. And while they waited inside that cave for Guabansek the hurricane to spend her fury, they huddled together and prayed. Yukau, Yukau, protect us, protect our children, protect our village. And Yaya and Atabe prayed too. Yaya El, may you be safe. May you be unharmed, Yaya El. But outside, Guabansek blew her winds, her strong, unstoppable winds. For hours, those winds blew and blew and blew. When finally the winds died down and the storm cleared, the people walked out of the cave and saw that Guabansek, the hurricane, had destroyed just about everything in the village. Only for a few trees remained still standing and a few huts were still not damaged and the people went looking for their missing ones. Yaya went looking for his son and he walked from village to village looking and looking and searching. And finally he made his way into the dense forest only to find devastation. Trees toppled, plants uprooted, rivers overflowing. And just before he turned around to go back to his village, he stumbled on Yaya's bow. Some hope, he thought. Yayael! Yayael! He called. Yayael! but there was no answer. Later that evening, when Ata Bey, when his wife Ata saw his, her husband return home with just the bow of their son in her husband's arms, she knew that they would never see their son again. And they huddled together and wept and all through the night they wept and wept. In the morning when they arose, they, they picked up the bow and placed it in a large gourd. Yaya said to Ata Bey, our son's bow will be safe here Ata. Let's hang it on the rafters. And so they lifted the gourd and hung it from the rafters of their hut. And time passed. And time passed. And with time, the people's grieving also passed. And slowly, the people began to rebuild their village and rebuilt their huts. The women slowly began to replant the surviving seeds. They planted corn, nyame, yuca, their sacred cassava. And with time, new green shoots began to sprout. And the men slowly began 
they're hunting again, but without the power of the Tabanuco tree and Yayael's skill, they've rarely brought back enough game to feed the entire village. Food was scarce. And then one day, Yaya turned to his wife, Ata, and said, Ata, I really miss our son, Ata. I miss our son. I, I want to hold his gourd. I want to feel him and feel close to him, Ata. And so Yaya reached up towards the rafters to lower the gourd. And as he was lowering the gourd, the gourd slipped from his hands and, and it tipped. And from it, fish came gushing out of the gourd. Silver, plump, beautiful fish came flowing out of the gourd, enough fish to feed the entire village. Ata, Yaya El is with us. His spirit has returned, Ata. Go gather the villagers. And so Ata gathered all the villagers while Yaya El cooked the fish on an open grill. And that night, the people of the village went to sleep with a barriga llena y corazón contento, full stomach, happy heart, feeling grateful for Yaya's gift. And so the next morning, Atabe went to Itiba's house, mother of the sacred twins. Itiba, I need your twins. I need your twins to watch over Yaya's gourd while I'm away in the field. So please let me, let me take your twins with me. And sure enough, the twins followed Atabe to her hut. And before leaving for the fields, Atabe turned to the twins and said, now boys, whatever you do, do not touch the gourd and do not let anyone touch the gourd. And then she went off to the fields to work. Well, it had been a long day, a long hot day. And as the day grew, the boy's hunger grew, but their curiosity grew even stronger. And one twin said to the other, Let's, let's bring down the gourd. Let's eat the fish and, and when we're done, we'll lift the gourd back up and no one will know. And right after he said that, that twin stood on top of the other twin's shoulders and he reached up for the gourd. And just as he reached for that gourd, they heard voices. It was Yaya and Atabe coming, returning from the fields. And in their haste to, to hang the gourd back up, the gourd fell onto the ground and broke open. And they stood in disbelief. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. They saw water pouring out of the gourd. First a trickle, then a stream, a torrent of water came pouring out of the gourd. And then a big wave came gushing out of the gourd, taking the twins with it. And Ata and Yaya with them, and all the people of the village leaving them at the edge of the field, sputtering and spitting and choking with, from the water. The water kept rising and rising. The people stood up as quickly as they could, they crawled up towards the mountain and up, up they went towards the top of the mountain. The water kept rising and rising. And from up above, they looked down and stood in awe, in awe as they watched the water rise more and more and more up above 
the rooftops of their huts, up above the, the, the new crops that they had planted and above the still remaining trees that were spared from Guabanseg. They became desperate. What if the water would sweep them away? And so Yaya stood by the edge of the mountain and called Yaya! Yaya! Enough! Basta! And right after he said that, the water stopped. The water stopped rising and it became still. The people looked over the edge of the mountain. They looked down and saw a wide expanse of blue green shimmering water covering the mountains. The four mountains had become four islands, Cuba, Jamaica, Jamaica, Santo Domingo, Hispaniola, y Boriquen, Puerto Rico. And that's the story that the Taino people, people of Puerto Rico told of how the sea began. Thank you for listening. Our next teller is Eldrina Duma. She grew up in the Pueblo tribes of Laguna, Tewa, and Hopi, where storytelling is a way of life. During everyday activities, family and friends shared Pueblo stories, songs, and family history, including the humorous and serious personal stories that life brought. Reflecting back, Eldrina realized that listening to story allowed her to strengthen and stimulate the use of her imagination and creativity. Stories helped her at an early age to develop her use of vocabulary, pronunciation, sentence structure, and taught her core values. A recipient of the prestigious John Henry Falk Award, she travels the country sharing her captivating stories. Aldrina Aldrin Aldrina's charity tonight is Laguna Community Foundation. Tiffany will post the link in chat. Please give a warm welcome to Aldrina Duma. Go ahead, see everyone. My English name is Eldrina. My Tewa name is Kunutsawe. It means blue corn. I come from the Pueblo of Goek. The Spaniards called us Lagunas. And I come from the village of Cuisch, from uh, in the Spanish word is Powati. And right now I'm making my home in Amarillo, Texas. I come from the clans of the Roadrunner on my mother's side and the Corn Clan from my father's side, the Tewa and Hopis. Tonight, I'm going to share with you a historical story that um, is personal to me because it is a part of my life. There was one day um, my aunt and I and my mom were coming back from Flagstaff, Arizona. We had gone to the um, Northern uh, Arizona Museum for Hopi days. And I took them along with me. And on the way back home, we were going to take our time. And I said to them, I said, do you know if you do you guys want to go through Winslow and just see what is left of the Laguna Colony? And they said, sure, let's go. We haven't gone in such a long time. And so we kind of veered off I-40 and went into Winslow, Arizona. The Laguna Colony was located on the western part of Winslow. And as we drove up to those tall chain link fence, it kind of brought back all of our memories. The, the gate was open, and so I drove them in. And when we got into the gate, we looked around. We could see the, the railroad in front of us, but there was nothing. It was flattened. All those 50 boxcars, gone. The community building that was used for all kinds of things, receptions, um, ceremonial dances in the winter and the summer, um, a time when they would uh, have Valentine's gatherings, 
and even the Hopis that lived in Winslow, sometimes they would come there and practice at this home and then dance for the community there at Laguna Colony. It was gone. The bathhouse that was shared by the men and the women, gone. The place where the women gathered to do their hair, whether it was dyeing or cutting or perming, gone. Laundry room, gone. The oven houses, gone. And to my sadness, along with all of that, the great trees that were in the plaza that was created for the dances of the people, they were all gone. We looked around and we said, wow, there's nothing here, nothing. And as we walked a little bit further into what once was a community, we saw the slabs. And we were imagining what used to be there. And I was depending on my mom and aunt to remind me of what buildings used to be there. And because of them, they were able to give me back the memory that I couldn't see anymore. You see, it all started for me um, when I was a little girl. Winslow was just a community to everybody in the world until this song that you might recognize. Standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona, such a fine sight to see. It was a hit that the Eagles made um, back in uh, 1972 with the song called Take It Easy. When we first heard that back at Laguna, Someone said, listen to this song, listen to this song. And, and we all stood around, uh, teenagers and, and junior high students. And, and then when we heard Winslow, Arizona, it was like a, somebody made a touchdown. And we said, yeah, Winslow, yay. They said Winslow. And we were so proud of that song. We were so proud of that song. And so let me take you back to where it all began, this Laguna Colony. When the Atkinson uh, Topeka Santa Fe started in about 1859, they were starting to lay their tracks across the country. And they got to the New Mexico area around 1880. And that's when a decision had to be made. They were going to go down into the Albuquerque area and then head west on into California. Well, they had already had an agreement with the San Domingo Pueblo um, their name for themselves is Kiwa. And so they had their agreement to come through their land and then they were heading west and they were to go into Laguna land. Well, they gathered with the leaders and they told them that they wanted to lay track through their land and what needed to be done to do that. They not only needed the land, but they also needed water. And so the Lagunas decided that maybe this is going to be something that would help them um, economically. And so they said, well, there are three things that um, we have decided after, after they took some time to think about it. And they came back to the table and they said, we would like jobs, housing, and kerosene because back then they used the, the lamps to light their houses. The electricity was not there in many of the homes there. And so the agreement was made. Now there wasn't a contract that was written. It was just a handshake. It was a verbal agreement that the two parties would agree to this. And it was called the flower of friendship. And from that day after annually, they would all come together, both leaders of the, the railroad and the Pueblo of Laguna, and discuss the agreement over again, maybe even with a train ride, a short train ride. And they referred to that as watering of the flower. Well, as time went on, and um, something took place to where uh, Santa Fe was involved and and of course uh, I don't you can't see the, the detail but there were big posters that were on calendars and uh, across the country and a lot of times there were Native American people Pueblo people in particular in those posters 
and they would advertise the tourisms that was getting ready to take place. And so um, one of the things that took place was that um, from what I understand from oral history that I was given was that the Santa Fe wasn't too excited about that agreement. And they really um, didn't feel like they needed to honor that because it never was on paper. But when they got, um, when they merged with Burlington Northern, there was a leader that just recent, not too long ago, that just happened to mention something to Burlington Northern because they kind of had no idea that there was this verbal agreement that had taken place back in 1880. And so our leader at the time came together to the table and discussed what once was and what was spoken. And the ears were open. Communication happened. When I last talked to someone to find out if they were continuing on with the renewing of this agreement, um, there was nothing solid that they could tell me that, that it hadn't really been decided on what was going on. But Burlington Northern did um, send some money to the Pueblo of Laguna to help them to create a historical department that could focus on the history of the railroad. And so that was pretty good. Um, until that time, we I don't know what happened beyond that. Now, how does it become a part of my story? Well, I was born in Winslow, Arizona, and my mother and her family lived at the Laguna Colony. And when I was a little girl, I remembered anxiously wanting to go and visit my relatives. We lived on the eastern part of Winslow, and my father and sometimes my grandpa would come and get us and take us to the colony. I loved the colony. I never even thought about the places being boxcars. They just, in my mind, were just like apartment buildings. And I loved the community baths because we could all go there and we could just enjoy conversation. And um, we all would go and they had many shower stalls and the different families were in charge of taking care of the cleaning on the men's side and the women's side. The men took care of their side and the women took care of theirs. And I was a part of that. I would go and help when my aunt's family was doing the cleaning. And I just enjoyed um, that community of coming together. And so um, the other thing that happened when the railroad came through New Mexico, they made colonies, not just in Winslow, but they had a colonies in Gallup, New Mexico, Winslow, Arizona, Barstow and Riverside, California. My mom said that her dad started out in Winslow and was approached to be transferred to Riverside, California. So she said, you know, we could have ended up in California, but he was going to have a, a kind of a dock and pay. His, his level of what he had worked up to was going to kind of come down in the movement. So he decided not to go and just stay there. I'm glad he did because uh, it was in the summer of my mother's junior year, her brother was working for the Santa Fe Railroad. And he happened to be working on the, the, the railroad that had been built into the Grand Canyon for tourism. And so while he was there, after my dad and my mom, they met in um, the Grand Canyon. And after they got married, my uncle got a job for my father. And so now my father went to work for the Santa Fe. And so the railroad has been instrumental in my life. My father and his family were a part of Santa Fe too. When the railroad started to go to the Southwest, they made stops along the way and the different tribes 
uh, kind of took it upon themselves. Every time there was a depot, they would have artists to go there and sell their artwork. And Fred Harvey was instrumental in getting the Harvey girls going in the ho Harvey houses. And he even started the tourism from into the Grand Canyon. And so um, from that, they went to um, Hopi land to where my father's people lived at First Mesa. And they contacted my great grandmother. Her name is Nempeyu. And Nempeyu was a potter. She was a well-known potter and in uh, the museums across the world, she is known as the, the Hopi potter, the kind of the one that revived Hopi pottery to what it is today. And so here's a picture of her that um, we, I have of her building, um, coiling one of her pots. She was sent to um, the Grand Canyon to go to the Hopi house and live there with her family, with her husband and children. And they there she would make her pottery, she would bake her pottery and sell her pottery. And so this is a picture of what I got when I went to go visit the Grand Canyon and they made a postcard and they blew it up. And then here is another one of my Saya Nempeo and my grandmother, her daughter, who was just a little girl in that picture. When I saw that at the Grand Canyon, I was so excited. I thought, oh, I wish my Saya was still alive so that I could show her these pictures. They blew them up from little postcards to big, big photos. My Saya, she would tell me these stories of going to the Grand Canyon and her mom going and then and then all the people that would come to her house to purchase pottery from all across the world. And so when my father ended up going to work for the Santa Fe, an unfortunate thing happened. He was working in the boiler room and it exploded. And so he got steam burns all over his body. He told me later that they told him that because he had a helmet on and long sleeve shirt, that that kind of protect him from worse damage. And so after this happened, they sent him to California to the closest burn center. And there he spent months trying to recover. His family back home had no idea what was going on, or even if he was alive, they were just hopeful that he was gonna make it through. And dad told me that there were times that he wanted to give up, but he just kind of dealt with the pain that he was um, feeling, because especially he said, when it came time to them putting me into this circle bathtub, and it was deep all the way up to my shoulders and I would be emerged in there sitting down and a nurse would come and she would scrub my body, trying to take the old dead skin away so the new skin could grow. He said it was like ants and bees stinging me. And there were times I just wanted to give up. But then I would think about my family. I would think about my mother and how she must be feeling, how everybody must be feeling not knowing what was going on with me. And so I endured the pain. He said, when it came time for him to um, leave, the doctor had come and said, Douglas, um, I don't want you to go right now. And he said, why? And he says, because um, they have a, a new surgery. It's a plastic surgery and they can fix your ears. You see with the, the intense steam, the heat of it, it, it kind of melted the flesh of his ear. And he said, well, how long would that take? And they said, well, you know, you'd have to stay uh, maybe about three more months for recovering of the ears. And my father said, three more months. I don't think I can handle staying away three more months. It's okay, just leave it like that. I can hear. And so my, ma my father decided, to come home. And 
because of all of the the um, things that he had to endure, all of the exercises that my mom had to try to get him to do, and the change of his whole body of what's what used to be, uh, it was hard. My mom and my dad, this was my dad before he got burned. When he got back home, they had some tough times and then the divorce happened. And so we kids, we stayed with my mom, eventually went to Laguna. My dad went back to First Mesa to be with his mom. And then the way it happened, I found my way back to my dad along with my two brothers and one stayed in New Mexico. And we lived back at First Mesa with my Saya and my dad. But Winslow was still there in my life because whenever we needed anything, dad and I, we would hitchhike to Winslow because he couldn't drive because that accident caused seizures and he could no longer work. He was unable to work, but he was hopeful. He kept saying, if I just get stronger, then maybe I can uh, get back to working. And so that's when he took up the art of making Kachina dolls. This doll came back to me just this year. It had been away from me for 30 years. I gifted this to a friend and he was afraid that his family would not appreciate this if something were to happen to him. And so he called me up this summer and he said, I'm going to be leaving, I'm going to be retiring and I'm going to be leaving Albuquerque. And I wanted to know if you wanted um, the gifts uh, that you had presented me and my family with. And I had forgotten all about this Kachina doll. And so I went to Albuquerque during the COVID. I didn't stay very long. I just drove about five hours, picked the box up, looked inside, and there it was. The gift that my dad had made. That was special because dad said the way that he got his fingers to move strong again, the way he got his body to work and his muscles strong again was to walk down to the wash the creek to go get the cottonwood roots and then come home and learn how to carve. He had mentors and then he did it on his own. But he said, Drina, every time I would carve, my, my muscles in my hands would get better. And sometimes when I would walk down to the wash, sometimes I remembered when I was a young boy and I would be running, running, and I was a fast runner. And so I would try to run the best I could. And I never gave up. And so I was happy with my dad. I was excited that he never gave up. My Saya had me hear that story from my father because as a little girl, and I went to the day school with friends, they made fun of my father and I wanted to be accepted because they were now my new friends. And so I just went along with them and made fun of my dad too. Whatever they would say, I would kind of say it too. And my Saya, she overheard me and she sat me down and she told me her story as a mother on what happened when he worked for the Santa Fe Railroad. And so she said, you know, Drina, Maybe someday you should get with your dad and let him tell you his story. And after I heard his story, I realized that sometimes you don't have to say, I love you. You just have to hear a story that shows love and talks of love. And so that was my dad's story and my Saya about the Santa Fe. And so um, my mom, you know, 
she and my dad, when they met there at the Grand Canyon, they went as teenagers working at the at the Bright Angel Lodge is where she started. And then the next year she went to go work at the laundromat. And I asked her, I said, mom, which one did you like the best? She said, I like Bright Angel Lodge. I don't know, there was just something about cleaning rooms and making those beds really nice and tight and then smelling those fresh sheets. And then the best thing was when we would gather at lunchtime, they let us all eat together, all of us kids from all different tribes. And that's how we got to learn about each other. And then the next year when I went to go work at the laundromat, it wasn't the same. We kind of had to eat separately and we didn't really gather around to get to know one another like we once did. My dad, on the other hand, he was kind of a, a I did all kinds of jobs there at the, the Grand Canyon. And one evening he said that there was a man that he met and they were talking through the night or talking that evening. And the man said, you know, Douglas, tomorrow I'm going to be um, kind of touring the Grand Canyon. And I wanted to know if maybe you could be my guide. And my father said, oh, no, I can't be your guide. Um, this is this is the job that I do. And they do have guides, though. And he said, but I want you. You seem to know everything about the Grand Canyon. Well, my dad was part Hopi and the Grand Canyon once was the land of the Hopis. And so my dad said, I'm sorry, but that's not my job. I don't know who this man was. Dad never spoke his name. And whoever he was, was a man of influence because the next morning my dad was called and he said he was gonna be the guide for this man. And so they went all over and enjoyed themselves. And then the man looked at his watch and said, Douglas, it's about time for us to have lunch together. And so dad said, oh, okay. Well, the man started to head to that fancy lodge. And my dad said, I can't go in there. He says, why not? He says, well, they told us that we're not allowed to go into that fancy lodge there. And just the workers that, that work there can. And the man said, wait right here. And he went inside. And when he came back, he said, Douglas, come on, you're my guest. And he went and took my dad in and they had lunch at that fancy lodge. Dad said when he walked in, the tables were beautiful. They had silverware and plates and, and glasses. And he said, I didn't know what to do. And then when they gave us the menu, the words were so fancy, I couldn't even read what was on there. The man understood just by looking at me. And he said, Douglas, would you let me order you lunch? And my dad closed his menu and said, yes, sir, please do so. And so they had lunch. It was good, Dad said. The man just kind of leaned back and he said, well, Douglas, what did you think about that? Dad said, I don't know what it was, but it was good. And the man said, well, guess, guess at what you think you might have eaten. So my dad thought, well, it's kind of like uh, maybe like pork chop, chicken. And the man leaned forward and he said, you just ate rattlesnake. Oh, my dad said, and then when my dad was telling my Saya and I that story, we both gasped too. Oh no, my dad said, oh my goodness. And he said, I had already swallowed everything so I couldn't spit anything out. The man couldn't understand and he said, what's the matter? And he said, oh no, you see, corn clan comes from my mother's side. My dad is snake clan. I just ate my relative. Oh, we're not supposed to even touch things like that. And so the man said, oh, I am so sorry. I did not know that. My Saya and I, we were still going, how could you eat a snake? And so anyway, those are some little stories about how the railroad came into our lives. And you know, those stories, were brought to me by many of my elders. We hold our elders very dear to us. They are our treasure. When one leaves, so does our culture, traditions, our songs, our stories. And so we depend on them. We depend on them.
And so if you are an elder, you are a treasure and we value you. And so I thank you tonight for listening in. I hope you learned a little bit about the railroad, the Laguna Colony, and a little bit about who I am. Thank you very much. Our next storyteller is Nash Jones. Nash is vice president of the Board of Storytellers of New Mexico with a focus on the organization's online presence, outreach, and member communication. Nash also produces and hosts the much-loved Duke City Story Slam, a monthly live personal storytelling competition, currently and sadly on hiatus due to the pandemic. They also bring stories to listeners across New Mexico through their work as a reporter for KUNM Public Radio, where they also host NPR's Morning Edition. Nash has always been a storyteller among friends and family, but began performing for audiences in Oakland, California in 2015. You can find more of their broadcasting work on Twitter and listen to their personal storytelling work on SoundCloud. Nash's charity is Transgender Resource Center of New Mexico. Tiffany will post all three links in chat. Please help me welcome Nash Jones. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, and if you'll mute, if you look at your little screen and just make sure you're muted, that helps me so that I can just concentrate and all of that. Um, thank you so much. And Aldrina, uh, fantastic job. That's a, that's a hard story to follow. You're very talented and I really appreciated hearing your story. So thank you for sharing. Um, okay. Um, so I'm standing in the bathroom with my older sister at the age of three and I'm, and I'm super excited. And I say, Mally, look, I have a penis. And my sister is five. She's blonde. She looks something like the little girl on the copper tone sunscreen bottle, you know, like the little girl with her, her pants being pulled down by the dog. And she thinks I don't know the right words to use and goes, no, silly, you don't have a penis. You have a Venus. We're girls. And it's not that I didn't know the right words to use. I knew the right words. I had probably just learned them, that boys have penises. And so what I was doing was looking for mine. You know, I, I grew up in Albuquerque in the 90s, and I always had a really strong sense of self around my gender. You know, my sister and I pretty much had identical upbringings, being only two years apart. And while both being declared girls at birth, our gender expressions couldn't have been more different. Like Halloween for her was an excuse to dress up in an elegant gown, whether that was like a fairy or a princess or a bride. Halloween for me was an excuse to dress up as anything with facial hair. <laughs> like Mally and I, we fought a lot as kids. Um, and though she was quick to make fun of me for everything I did, I never remember her picking on my gender. Like it was just who I was. Like there was, there was no other way that it could be. And my parents were cool too. Uh, my mom wrote in my baby book that at two and a half years old, probably like the first sentence I had ever spoke, I declared to her, I am a boy. But remember, it was the year 1990. So this kind of thing wasn't like sending alarm bells off in parents' heads yet. So, you know, that wasn't the case, but, but she did let me express myself. You know, she let me cut my hair short. Uh, it, I had like a bowl cut with like the undersides where you like lift it up and the underside was shaved. It was a very in look in the early nineties. Um, she let me wear what I wanted to wear, which was um, often some combination of black velvet pants, um, suspenders, oversized cow print cowboy boots, and like a multicolored beret. Like I was, styling. And um, my dad, well, he would later admit that he wasn't super thrilled to have who he believed was this like baby lesbian running around. Um, he was super excited to have an athlete in the family since my much older brother hadn't been much into team sports. So my dad encouraged me in sports, which was great because instead of my body being this point of tension between us, this hindrance, um, it was something that was accept acceptable. It was an asset. It was something that brought us closer together because it made me athletic. Um, I have always been a people pleaser. I like people to like me. And while my family was accepting, 
being raised and socialized as a girl, I didn't have the skills that I needed to live as a boy at school without getting a lot of shit for it. You know, side eye glances and laughs and, and just barriers to participating because I didn't know what something was or I didn't know how to do it because adults were only teaching those kinds of things to the boys. That is until Robbie moved to town. Um, Robbie moved to New Mexico from London, England in first grade. We were six years old. Uh, to picture Robbie, you can think of Ricky Gervais, the comedian, if you know, if you know him. Uh, he was even British like him, but without the potty mouth and like six years old, so like tiny. <laughs> and Robbie, he affirmed my gender from day one. Like I told him when we first became friends that I was feeling a lot of pressure to grow my hair out. And he was like, no way, don't do it. Like, I think you look cool like that. Robbie took me under his wing and he taught me the ways of first grade boys. Like he loved American football. It was his whole life. And when I couldn't hang out with him during recess because I didn't know how to play the game, he taught me. We would run drills in his front yard like every weekend and I got damn good at that game. I, I was a foot taller than the next tallest person in my class, like the 99th percentile of the growth chart. I was, I was huge. And so I gained the status and the popularity amongst the boys at recess as the all-time QB, which is the quarterback for both teams at recess. So I was just like killing it. But as a girl, I wasn't able to play in the football team after school, like in the leagues. So what I did was decided to join a co-ed basketball team. My dad became the coach. We were the silver bullets. And with my short hair and everything, one of the boys that first day of practice said something like, oh, dang, he's tall. Like they thought I was a boy too. And when he said that, at first I got really embarrassed because it reminded me of when substitute teachers would think the same thing. Like I would get excited at first getting served or young manned by the sub until my classmates would overhear it and they would just erupt in laughter. You know, that people pleasing thing I told you about. I mean, I'd just be humiliated. Um, and when that would happen, when I was a kid, I took to sneaking in before class when I had heard that we were going to have a sub. And they'd be like, you know, what are you doing in here? Like, you're not supposed to be in here because it was before class started. And then like my like meek little voice, I'd look up and be like, um, so um, I'm a girl, just so you know, because sometimes people don't know and it's really embarrassing. And <laughs> I mean, they'd often look at me with some mix of like surprise and, and pity and, and shoo me out to the playground. But the thing was, I didn't know anybody on my basketball team and better yet, they didn't know me. So there was no one there to laugh when he said that. And so I went with it and I got to live my entire season as a boy. It was like this haven for me after school until about the end of the season when my dad, who was the coach, got really excited about something that I had done in practice. I like executed a good pick and roll or something. And he goes, that a girl. everything was silent. All I heard was like the ball kind of drop and, and dribble off to the side. And one of my teammates looks at me and goes, you're a girl? Like disgusted. I was busted, like totally found out. And yet again, humiliated absorbing the message that this thing that felt very right was actually very, very wrong in everyone else's eyes. So I was thinking about all this, basically gender policing that I was experiencing at the kitchen table one morning. I was six years old. So, I mean, my feet weren't even touching the ground. They were kind of swinging below the chair. And on the table was this little red box of sun-made raisins. Do you guys know the box? There's like the sun maid on there. She's um, got her brown hair and her red bonnet and her tray of grapes. And she's like very pretty and, and feminine. And as a kid, you know, I wasn't really given many examples of what it looked like to be a masculine woman. So I thought, okay, if everyone's right and I'm a girl, then maybe I'm gonna somehow someday grow up to be a feminine woman because those were the examples I had. And I was looking at the sun-made raisin box on the table and I was like, well, we kind of have 
similar hair color, kind of a similar skin tone. Like, I guess someday something's gonna happen and I'm gonna turn into something like this sun made lady. And from then on, she became this vision of the future that I carried with me. Like, I didn't know what was gonna happen to get me there, but someday something would happen and I was gonna turn in to the sun made. Well, that thing that would happen, it happened just three years later. I was nine. I was sitting on the carpet in the den of my childhood home playing Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis. Uh, it was the 90s <laughs> and I had this itch on my chest and I went to scratch it and I felt this hard rock under my nipple. And I was like, oh my God, I have cancer. Like this is definitely a tumor. I am definitely dying. And like so many kids at that age, unfortunately, who are going through something confusing and scary, I decided I wasn't gonna tell anybody about it. But at night, I would pull on it and I would tug on it and I would I try to dig my nails behind it and like pop it out like it was a zit or something. And not two months later, I was spending the night at Robbie's house and I woke up in the middle of the night and I had just like a terrible stomach ache, the worst of my life. And I got up and I kind of snuck down the hall to wake up Robbie's mom. And, and I told her what was going on and, and she was so sweet. And she stayed up with me like all night until my mom came and picked me up in the morning. And when I got home with my mom, I just collapsed on the couch and I was just like wailing. I was writhing in pain and screaming and crying. And my mom kind of like kneeled down next to me on the couch. And she was like, you know, um, maybe you should, you should try, to, try to go to the bathroom or something. You know, like you have a stomach ache. And so I did. And of course, when I got there, I discovered blood in my underwear and I'm nine. Right? Like I haven't gone through sex ed. I didn't know what was going on, but I thought I did. You know, what I thought was, it's the cancer. <laughs> I am dying. And yet again, scared and embarrassed, I decided I wasn't gonna tell my mom that I had been sick for months and I had let it build to this point. But when I broke out in tears, when I came out of the bathroom, she knew something was up. And I told her, I'm bleeding. And before I could dive into all the cancer symptoms that I hid from her for months, she knew what was going on. And I know that she was sad that her little tomboy was gonna be going through a very early puberty, but she tried to like feign some excitement and was like, oh, no, like, this is exciting. You're becoming a woman. This is wonderful. And I thought, oh, becoming a woman. Like, this is what happens. This is when I become the sun maid. Now's the time, you know? And I thought, now's the time I have to stop being a boy and start being a girl. And the only examples that I had at the time told me girls do not hang out with boys. So the first thing that I need to do was to go to school the next day with that huge pad shoved down my pants. And I pulled Robbie to the side before class. Uh, we were outside the building, just in the grass there, waiting for the bell to ring. And I told him, I can't be your friend anymore. And I can't play football anymore. And I definitely, definitely can't spend the night at your house anymore. And he was super confused. He was like, what? Like, is this cause you got sick at my house? Like, I didn't get you sick. This, this isn't my fault. What do you mean? It was kind of like, it was like a straight up old yeller moment. If you know the scene when the little boy takes the dog out and he says, I hate you, go away, never come back. So that he doesn't have to conjure up the honesty that it takes to face what's really going on. So my life detoured and aiming for that sun made, I never wore a red bonnet, but I definitely wore some red spaghetti strap shirts and short shorts from Abercrombie. And just like I tried to be the kind of boy that had status and popularity on the playground, I was gonna try to be the kind of girl that had status and popularity. I decided I was gonna become a middle school mean girl. 
and it wasn't easy. <laughs> you know, I didn't have the natural femininity of a girl like Alexi Goldberg. You know, Alexi was the Regina George of our school. That is the, the girl that every boy liked. She would have been the head cheerleader if we had had a cheer team at my school, which thank God we didn't, because I would probably have more photos than I already regret from that era. But since I wasn't an Alexi with her, you know, perfect messy bun and, and her bubbly handwriting, which, you know, I, I envied, um, I used what I did have. You know, I had my social skills from basically growing up as a boy. Like I wasn't intimidated by the boys. I knew how to get along with them, even though I had to hang out with this group of girls that choreographed Spice Girls dances in Alexi's basement and, and gave ourselves our own Spice nicknames. There was Sporty and Sassy and Sweetie. And of course, Alexi was sexy. And I guess I drew the short straw because my nickname was Spiffy. Um, so, you know, even though most of the boys came up to my waist and I had braces and a frizzy ponytail and makeup that was caked on like a clown, the boys liked me. But unfortunately, just not in the way that I wanted them to. You know, um, they considered me one of the guys, which was not getting me a boyfriend, which of course I absolutely needed. So um, I decided to use other of my assets, which was that I was developed. I mean, many of the other girls weren't gonna get their periods for years. And what can get a middle school boy who doesn't think you're hot to go out with you anyway? Putting out. And so I did. We had these uh, burn books in seventh grade. The popular girls had one and the popular boys had their own and we would pass them around the group and they were just full of like gossip and shit talking written in gel pen. And as girls, we would sign our entries with our Spice Girls names as our first name and then the last name of our boyfriend. And so I was Spiffy Hayes. I had begun dating Aaron Hayes, the school's bad boy. He was already uh, growing a mustache at the age of 13. And he would like get into fights and he was like one of the only boys who wasn't a prep or a jock or a skater. He wore baggy clothes and bling and kind of this like, slim shady white rapper type. And I had gotten him to take interest in me because one, he was horny. And two, I was the only girl who knew all the lyrics to Fantasy, which was the new Ludacris song that year. <laughs> and, um, you know, in the boys burn book, um, they would use like code names, basically like symbols to talk about everyone that they wrote about. And it started going around school that my nickname in the boys burn book was the letter P with a cross through it. And that it stood for not prude, AKA I was the seventh grade's resident slut. You know, I was the only girl who wasn't bashful about laying one on the boys during spin the bottle. In fact, um, it, I was the first girl at my very uptight private middle school to French kiss a boy. It was on a dare the year before. Uh, this boy, Chris, and I were standing in the middle of a circle of like 20 other 12-year-olds waiting to be picked up by our parents after school. And we passed a, a warhead sour candy between our mouths. It was quick and it was sloppy and it was later credited with starting the makeout craze of the sixth grade that year. You know, I even, held, <laughs> I even held a kissing workshop on the trampoline in the backyard of the first boy-girl party of the seventh grade. I was teaching all my guy friends who, des who I desperately wanted to like me how to do it right so that they could get the girls who they actually liked to date them. So all those boys, they own me. <laughs> About a... About a month before the Not Prude nickname came out and spread all around the school, my boyfriend Aaron and I, we were walking to our lockers one day after the Battle of the Bands, which was this competition between the band and the orchestra and the choir. Like the whole school had been there and Aaron and I had been playing, playing footsie. And on our walk back, he was trying to convince me to give him a hand job. And he was like, what? It's, it's just like an arm. Like, would it weird you out to touch my arm? <laughs> and though I was very much weirded out to touch his very much not an arm, I did it. Because sexuality was one of the only currencies that I had 
Like it was the closest thing to being the tallest kid on the playground, the all-time QB that I had access to anymore. Like despite earning my spot with the in crowd and having an enviable boyfriend, everything that I thought a middle school girl should be and should want, I was miserable. Like I was trying to make this work, you know, act like the girls act, dress like the girls dress, and none of it came naturally. And every day I woke up just having to put this ill-fitting costume back on. I just full of dread and I felt sick. Like maybe puberty was an illness after all, and it was chronic. Like it was a deep, deep sorrow knowing that I was gonna have to do this for the rest of my life because there were no other options. But you can only fake who you are for so long. You know, it's exhausting. And if you find an opportunity to take a rest, you will take it. And my opportunity luckily came just that next year in eighth grade. It was the first day of basketball practice and all of us girls were gathered on the bleachers getting a talk from the coach. When suddenly, <laughs> ooh, sorry, I'm losing my light. When suddenly the doors to the gym swung open and Kate walked in. She was a varsity basketball player who coach was telling us at the moment, uh, she was gonna help us out with, with practices that year. And it was like one of those slow-mo daydream moments that you see in romantic comedies. Like she opened the gym doors and she like dribbled over to the group with her blonde slick back ponytail kind of bouncing side to side. And Kate was kind of tall and, and gangly. She wasn't butch exactly, but she wasn't a girly girl. She was like into ROTC, like the student army. And she wore baggy jeans and hoodies and I was head over heels, like butterflies, heart thumping out of my chest, nearly falling out of the bleachers in love with her. We would pass each other in the hallways at school and she would like give me these little high fives and uh, they just like send shivers down my spine. And I filled an entire journal that winter with love poems about Kate and made home, homemade signs to go cheer for her at the varsity basketball games. And when she got into the Air Force Academy, I spent all of my savings on an edible arrangement <laughs> that I had delivered to her house. Very romantic. Um, I will spare you the saga uh, that was my epic two-year unrequited crush on Kate, um, because more importantly to this story was what that crush gave me permission to do. You know, suddenly it was so clear I wasn't a boy, I was gay. Like there were women who weren't sun made ladies who were masculine like me. And I found them late at night in Curve Magazine which is like the Cosmo for lesbians that I hid under my bed away from my parents. And in the classic 90s lesbian movies like If These Walls Could Talk Too and But I'm a Cheerleader which I rented from Hastings and never took back and I would pop into the VCR every single time my parents left the house. You know, it was finding the lesbian community that finally allowed me to refine my masculinity, my authentic gender expression. I cut my hair short again, I found clothes that felt affirming and I stopped trying to impress all those gross horny boys. And it was close enough to back on track from that detour to be a livable situation for about a decade. I went through high school and college as the token lesbian in my friends group and socially, I was able to be authentically myself and it was joyful and it was freeing. But under those clothes was still those tumors. You know, and every month I was still getting that period that would just wreck me like physically and emotionally. And it would take me right back to that painful place of sorrow and dread and self-hate. So at 26, 17 years after that sleepover at Robbie's house, I decided I needed to take the next step and, and transition medically with hormones and with surgery. And it wasn't the idea of like getting called sir by strangers or, or walking down the street with my partner and getting read as a straight couple that got me there. Because that in fact was a very big barrier to me understanding that this is what I needed to do. You know, I was a feminist 
And I had fought for several long years to be respected as a woman who looked and acted like I did. And I wasn't so sure that I wanted to walk around the world being read as a man, you know, someone with a very different history than the one that I had lived. But it wasn't when I thought about everyone else's perceptions of my gender that got me there. Because like I said, like socially, I was exactly who I was supposed to be, who I wanted to be, where I wanted to be. But it was when I was alone in my body, you know, my relationship with my physical parts that I knew unequivocally that this is what I needed to do. So the first person that I called from my family was my big sister, Mallory. It was looking a lot less like the copper tone sunscreen girl and a lot more like Uma Thurman at that point in our lives. And thank goodness I told her first. Because you know, when you're about to jump off a cliff and you look down and all you see below you are clouds and you have no idea what lies on the other side, it is damn hard to take that leap. You know, you need to surround yourself with people who believe in you. Um, who trust you, who know you. And Mally, my big sister, she was really the only person still in my life at that point who knew me back before the detour. You know, she knew that little kid. She knew my most authentic self. And so, of course, she was affirming. You know, she wanted me healthy. And while she did not know any trans people at the time, she made me feel while we were talking that maybe it wasn't such a strange thing to do. You know, maybe I wasn't crazy. Maybe actually I was right about what I needed to do. Like I mentioned a few times, I think I'm a people pleaser, remember? So my big fear of transitioning was that it was going to isolate me, you know, make me too weird to be liked by like the masses, by my parents, like middle-aged tennis club friends. And how would I ever go back to my high school reunion, which is totally something that I would want to do, you know, but after a lifetime of making decisions to try to be liked by everyone else and yet still not liking myself, I was ready to try something new. So I got top surgery, which is chest reconstruction, and I cut out the cancer. And I started taking testosterone, and it wasn't when my voice dropped or when I grew facial hair that I finally started to feel at ease in my body. But it was three months in when that dreadful period ended. It was such a momentous occasion, the first skipped period, and I knew it wasn't coming back, that I felt like I needed to mark it with some kind of, you know, rite of passage, a, a ceremony for myself. So I gathered all of my period panties, and I stuck them in a bag, and I built a huge fire in my backyard. And as I tossed the underwear in, and I watched them catch fire, a huge burden lifted. And I knew that I had finally made it back home. Thank you. For our last story, it seems only fitting that the teller who opened our evening by taking us on a beautiful and haunting journey will bring us home again. Please <coughs> welcome back, Liz Manuel. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Great. Well, that was wonderful, Nash. You know, I, I just admire your, you seem so e comfortable with yourself when you're telling stories. And, and I love the way you constructed that story. And you just did a wonderful job. I also learned so much. The closest thing that I ever got to being on the opposite side was when I was a young girl, I was a tomboy. And I couldn't wait to get home and wear my, my, um, my cousin Victor's clothes that I would inherit from him so that I could go run races outside. I played a lot outside and especially when it was warm and climb fences and things like that. So, so um, thank you for sharing yourself with us. And um, again, everyone, now we are going to enter the dream time. And um, this is a story that, you know, I, I, I was really had a little bit of a hard time figuring out what story to tell for celebration this year. And um, so that's why it was split into two 
parts to my telling, which was one that I already knew, and then a new one that I learned. And this one is one that had been shelved on our bookshelves for the longest times. And, and then as I was going through our old books, this one popped out from a book called The Fish Bride. And it's a collection of stories of the Romani people. So this is a story that a Rome person told in the 1930s in a small town in Iowa. And the writer, the collector of these stories has brought it to the world with, with us to share with you. So after the long darkness, after the long darkness when magic was everywhere. The sower released a handful of rice grains on the wind. And then the sower called on the wind messengers and instructed the wind messengers to tell the people of the sowing, tell them to tend to the rice fields and the rain will follow. And so it was that the people tended to the rice fields with much love and care. And for many generations, rice land flourished. There was a time when a king ruled over the land and in his court, there lived a magician. And one day, it was discovered that the magician had been practicing black magic. And when the king learned of this, he instantly banished him from his court. And in a rage, the magician flew off on a carpet. Well, he flew off on the wings of a great black bird but not before unleashing a bag full of wicked curses. The people scurried to gather the curses. They managed to contain all of them, but one, the worst curse of all, drought. Drought, everything that was green, turned brown and dry, crops failed, all things suffered. Living in, living in Riceland at the time was, were three families, three Romani families. They were singers, dancers, musicians. And in better times, they brought great joy to the land. But one among them, the youngest girl among them, Lala Pombo, did not sing, did not dance, and played no music at all. And she would often ask herself, who am I? What is my gift? One day, the king called a great council. He wanted to find a way to bring an end to the drought. He consulted diviners, astrologers, scholars, men and women of science, but their scrolls, charts, or mystical incantations could, bring, could not bring an end to the drought. Rice land had fallen. One day, Lala Pomba was sitting by a window, gazing out at the parched land. She turned to her mother and said, it's so dry out there. There is not a single grain of rice in the bin, mother. I wish there was something I could do to help. There is nothing you can do, my dear. There is absolutely nothing anyone can do. 
unless you could bring the rain. The rain? Well, where does the rain live? If only we knew, if only we knew. Well, that night, Lala Pombo had a restless night's sleep. All through the night, she tossed and turned, dreaming dreams of fear, anxious dreams, but also hopeful dreams. In the morning when she arose, she woke up with a new sense of purpose and she called out, Mother, today I will go in search of the rain. You can imagine how her mother felt. Well, all day she tried to stop her daughter from going on the journey, fearing for her safety but there was nothing that she could do to stop her. Later that evening, she gave her daughter the, her blessings and sent her on her way. That night, Lala Pombo walked through the moon gate. She entered a world without borders and beyond time. She looked around and with no direction, she walked on. And she traveled over steep mountain passes, forded raging rivers and crossed wide valleys. And then one day she came to a great city and in that city, she searched for the learned men and women of the city, and she told them of her journey of in search for the rain. And she stayed with them for a while, listened to their stories. She marveled at their stories of knowledge and wisdom. But at the end of the day, she did not learn where the rain lived. And Lala, walked on. How long she traveled, no one knows. But one day she came to, she came to a small village. And here she asked the villagers, she told the villagers of her quest for the rain. They advised her to go to the marketplace, sit with the merchants who traveled from one end of the world to another. Maybe there you could, here where the rain lives. And she did. She sat with them and, and, and marveled at their wondrous tales. But still she, she did not hear where the rain lived. And Lala walked on. Now Lala, Lala came, traveled to wilder and even more remote places until one day she came to an encampment, an encampment of seekers and nomads and tent dwellers. And there she thought, surely the people here will know where the rain lived. And she told them of her journey and, and of her quest for rain. And she stayed with them for a while. And she listened to their stories of adventure of love and loss of fools and wise ones. But still she did not hear where the rain lived and Lala moved on. It had been such a long journey. One night she found herself sleeping underneath the stars and feeling like she was just about to give up hope of ever finding where the rain lived. But in the morning when she awoke, she pushed on. And then one day, Lala emerged from a dense forest and stepped onto the shores of a great sea. The full moon was just rising, casting a shimmering light from See to shore. Lala knew that she could go no further. 
and she dropped to her knees and sunk into the soft sand, closed her eyes and listened. She listened as the sea, she heard voices coming from the sea, the sky, the earth, the wind, whispering stories to her. She knew that she had arrived. She was in the presence of the sower. She told the sower of her journey and of her search for rain. Please, please sow the rice again. Bring back the rain. Make rice land thrive again. Lala, those I sowed the rice after the long darkness, Lala, when magic was everywhere. And those were the old times. These are new times, Lala. And because you have offered yourself to save rice land, you, Lala, are the bridge, is, you're the bridge between the old and the new. Hold out your hand, Lala. And the sower placed a handful of golden grains on her palm and said, now go back home, Lala. Sow the rice grains. Sow them and the rain will come. And Lala, when you get home, tell the stories of your journey. Tell the stories that you heard in the cities from the city dwellers, from the merchants, from the seekers. But even more important, tell the stories that you heard here, Lala. Tell the stories that were whispered to you from the secrets of the universe. And so it was that Lala made the long journey back to rice land. She sowed the rice grains and the rain did follow and rice land flourished once again. Lala completed her journey, her quest to bring back the rain. And along the way, she discovered the answer to that, to that question that she had asked long ago, who am I? What is my gift? Lala had become a storyteller and she followed the storyteller's path for the many long years of her life. Thank you. Thank you for listening and thank you for being part of this evening with us tonight. Thank you. See you later. <laughs> to my wonderful storytellers, Nash, thank you. Aldrina, thank you. Thank you. Liz, thank you. Happy I holidays to everyone. Stay safe. I love seeing all of you guys. Bye. Bye. We love seeing you too.